Chapter 9 I sat in my dark hut and felt both angry and sad. One half of me wanted to hurt the people who had hurt me. The other half of me still loved them. In the end, I decided to try and speak to the old man again. I fell into an unhappy sleep. But when I woke in the morning, the family had gone. They had left the house during the night. I knew the name of only one other person. Although I had seen you, Frankenstein, for only a few moments, I knew that I belonged to you. When I had left your house, I had picked up a small bag. There was a book in the bag, and I could now read it. From it, I learnt my Creator's name and address. You had made me. But why had you not looked after me and saved me from this pain and unhappiness? I decided to go to Geneva to find you. One day, as I was travelling, I saw a young girl running along the side of a river. Suddenly she fell into the water. I jumped into the river, fought against the fast-moving water, and brought her back to land. While I was doing this, the girl's father, who was looking for her, reached us. He was carrying a gun, and when he saw me, he fired. The bullet hit my arm and broke it. I fell to the ground in great pain, and the man and the girl ran into the woods as fast as they could, and left me. The bullet was deep in my arm, and I lost a lot of blood. After some days, my arm began to get better, but I became sadder and angrier than before. I had saved the girl's life, and how did they thank me? With a bullet in the arm. I began to realize that there was no happiness for me in life. Hate grew stronger in me every day. Hate for you, my creator, who had made me. Two months later, I reached Geneva. That evening I hid among some trees outside the town and went to sleep. But I woke when a little boy ran into my hiding place. I thought I would catch the child and make him my friend before he was old enough to be frightened of my terrible face. I caught the little boy. But when the child saw me, he covered his eyes with his hands and screamed loudly. Let me go, you monster, the child shouted. Let me go, or I will tell my father, Mr. Frankenstein. He will call the police, and they'll punish you. Frankenstein, I shouted. You belong to my enemy, the man that I want to hurt. The child fought and screamed, and I put my hand round his neck to stop him shouting. In a moment, the child lay dead at my feet. I looked down at his body and was pleased with what I had done. I knew that the death of this child would hurt you, Victor Frankenstein, my creator. Then I saw something bright round the child's neck. It was a gold chain, and on the end of it was a picture of a very beautiful woman. I knew that a beautiful woman would never smile at me, 
and I wanted to run into Geneva and kill as many people as I could. But I stopped myself and went to look for another hiding place. Soon I found a hut, which seemed to be empty. But when I entered, I saw a pretty young woman asleep on the floor. I hated her because she was pretty. So I put the gold chain into one of her pockets, and then, before she could wake up, I ran away. I knew the police would think that she had killed the little boy. Chapter 10. Victor Frankenstein continues his story. The monster finished telling me his story, and then he said, I am alone and miserable. Only someone as ugly as I am could love me. You must make another creature like me, a woman monster, to be my wife. I shall never make another creature like you, I shouted. You have done enough evil on your own. If you don't help me, I shall make you more miserable than you have ever been in your life. You will wish you were dead, the monster said. But if you make another monster to be my friend, we won't hurt anyone. Be kind to me now, and I will learn to love and be kind. I thought long and hard about the monster's words. I felt sorry for him. He was so miserable. Perhaps I should help him. I shall do what you ask, I told him. But you must promise to live somewhere in the world where nobody lives. You must promise to stay away from other people. I promise. I promise, he cried. Please, start your work. I shall watch you, and when you are ready, you can be sure I will come back. He turned and left me, and ran down the mountain. I went back to Geneva immediately. My family were very worried when they saw me. I was pale, and my eyes were wild. I could not forget my promise to the monster and the awful work that waited for me. But I had to do it. It was the only way to keep my family safe, safe from his murdering hands around their necks. I needed to study for several months to make a woman monster successfully. I heard that an English scientist had done some useful work, so I decided to go to England. Before I went, my father asked me, Are you going to marry Elizabeth, or do you love another woman? Is this why you are so unhappy? No, father, I replied. I have always loved Elizabeth, and I want to marry her. But... I must do one more piece of scientific work before we can marry. I must go to England to do the work, and I want to marry Elizabeth when I return. My father and Elizabeth did not want me to go to England alone, because I had been so ill. They spoke to my old friend Henry Clerval, and he was very happy to travel with me. I was pleased that he could come, although I did not want him to discover anything about my horrible work. Henry and I reached London in early October and stayed there for a few months. I met and talked with English scientists and learned many useful things from them. 
Then Henry was invited to visit some friends in Scotland. I planned to travel with him, but I told him that I wanted to go walking in the mountains alone. Henry was not happy with my plan, but in the end he agreed. I bought all that I needed for a laboratory and sent everything to Scotland. Henry and I travelled to Edinburgh together, and then I went further north to find a good place for my laboratory. At last, I found the right place on an island off the north coast. It was a wild and lonely place. Only five people lived on the island, so I could work alone, and nobody would discover my awful secret. There was a large, empty hut on the island, and I brought builders from Scotland to make the hut into a laboratory for me. I showed them how to build my mast, and soon everything was ready for me to start work on the woman monster. Chapter 11 One evening, two months later, I was sitting in my laboratory. Most of my work was done, and I could finish the woman monster that night. But I wondered if I should finish the work. Was I making a monster more evil than the first creature? Perhaps a thousand times more evil. How could I know? Perhaps the woman monster would be another murderer. She had not promised to stay away from other people. Perhaps the two monsters would hate each other and would kill and murder and destroy without end. As I thought these things, I looked up at the window. Suddenly, in the moonlight, I saw the monster's awful face looking at me, and in his yellow eyes I could see only hate and evil. I knew he would not keep his promise. I went over to the laboratory table where the new creature was lying. I pulled off the wires that joined her to my machine. I took a sharp knife and cut through the body that I had joined together so carefully. Through the window, the monster saw me destroy his woman. With a loud and miserable scream of sadness and lost hope, he ran into the laboratory. You have destroyed all my hopes of happiness, he cried. You have left me with one feeling, hate, and with one wish, to destroy your happiness. You will be sorry that you were ever born. Remember this. I shall be with you on your wedding night. He ran quickly out of the laboratory, and I watched him as he left the island in his boat and sailed away across the sea. I sat and cried as I thought of the danger to Elizabeth. But I knew that the monster would not visit us until our wedding night. I would not die easily, and I would try to kill him before he could kill me. The next morning, I received a letter from Henry. He told me that he was waiting for me to return. I decided to clear the laboratory and to leave the island on the following day. So I returned to the laboratory, where the pieces of the woman monster's body still lay on the floor. I put them all in a large bag with some heavy stones. Then I took the bag to my boat and sailed out to sea. I threw the bag into deep water and watched it disappear. I was happier than I had felt for months. I knew I had done the right thing, and now there would be no second monster to follow the first. I was very tired, and I went to sleep in the boat. 
I do not know how long I slept, but when I woke up, I was in the middle of a storm. The wind was driving me further out to sea, and my boat began to fill with water. I knew I was in great danger. After some hours, the storm passed, and I saw land to the south. Soon I could see the beach, and a crowd of people standing and watching me. The faces were cold and unfriendly. As I landed, four of the men came towards me and took me by the arms. We are taking you to Mr. Cohen, the judge. He wants to ask you some questions about the murder of a man here last night, one of the men told me. I was sad to hear of the murder, but I did not worry about it. I had been far away at the time and knew nothing about any murder. It would be easy to explain that. So I went with the men to the large house where Judge Kerwin lived. Chapter 12 The judge was an old, kind man, but his face was very serious as he looked at me. He asked a number of men to tell me what they had seen and found the night before. The first man told his story. He and his son were coming home from a long day's fishing. It was a dark night, and on the beach they had fallen over the dead body of a man. They had carried the body to the nearest house, and found that it was a good-looking young man about twenty-five years old. There were the marks of fingers round his neck. When they spoke of the marks of fingers, I remembered the murder of my brother, and I felt a terrible fear. The son then told his story. He had seen a boat with a man in it, not far from the beach. He thought it was my boat. A woman had also seen a man in a boat sailing away from the beach. She thought I was the man. Then I was taken to the room where the dead body lay. How can I tell you what I felt when I saw the body? I put my arms round it and cried, What have I done? My friend, my dear friend. The body was Henry Clavel's, and so now I had destroyed another person. This third death was too much for me. I fell down in a kind of madness, and they had to carry me from the room. For two months I was very ill and wished only to die. But slowly my madness left me, and my health began to return. At last I was able to speak to Judge Kerwin, and I asked for news of my family. There is someone here who can answer your question better than I can, he said. Your father arrived a few minutes ago, and is waiting to see you. For the first time since Henry's death, I felt some happiness. I held out my hands to my father as he came into the room, and he took me in his arms. He gave me the good news that Elizabeth and Ernest were safe and well. I was really too ill to travel, but I asked my father to take me home immediately. The police had found somebody who had seen me on my island at the time of the murder, and so the judge let me go free. My father looked after me on the long journey home and sat with me for every minute. Night after night while I was asleep, I shouted that I was the murderer of William, Justine and Henry. My father asked me why I said these awful things. I wanted to answer his question, but 
I could not tell him my terrible secret. He thought that I was still a little mad. We stayed for a few days in Paris on the way home, and Elizabeth wrote to me at our hotel. This is what her letter said. My dearest Victor, I am so happy to know that you will soon be home. But I am afraid that Henry's death is not the only reason for your sadness. Do you still want to marry me, or do you love another woman? You must tell me. I love you, Victor, and I dream of the day when I shall be your wife. But I do not want you to marry me just because your parents wanted it. I can only be happy if you are happy. Do not answer this letter. Wait until you arrive before you give me your answer. But if you are well, and if I can make you smile, I need nothing more to make me happy. With all my love, Elizabeth. I replied immediately. I told her that I loved her very much and wanted to marry her. I remembered the monster's promise to be with me on the night of my wedding. Let him come. We would fight to the death on that night. And after that fight, I would either be dead and at peace, or alive and free. Free to be happy with Elizabeth. We arrived in Geneva soon after my letter had reached Elizabeth. It was wonderful to see her again. She ran into my arms and I held her close. She cried when she saw how thin and old I looked. She too was thinner because she had worried about me so much. But her gentleness and her love made her as beautiful as ever. We agreed that the wedding would be in ten days' time. As the day came nearer, I became more and more afraid. I tried to hide my fear and laughed and smiled as often as I could. Elizabeth knew that I was unhappy, but she was sure she could give me happiness. She looked forward to our wedding. I began to carry a gun and a knife with me everywhere I went. Chapter 13 After the wedding, a large number of our friends came to a party at our house. When the party had started, Elizabeth and I said goodbye and left for our honeymoon. We travelled first by boat and planned to spend the night at a hotel on the other side of the lake. The mountains and the lake were calm and beautiful, and at last Elizabeth and I were together. For the first time for months, and for the last time ever, I enjoyed the feeling of happiness. In the evening, the wind became stronger, and soon a great storm broke above us. Every noise frightened me, and I kept my hand on my gun under my coat. I saw the monster in every shadow. Suddenly, I realized how terrible the fight would be for Elizabeth. I asked her to go to bed, and I decided to search for the monster. I planned to join her when I was sure he was not in or around the hotel. Elizabeth left me, and I searched every corner of the hotel, every dark doorway and staircase. I could not find him. And I began to hope that he had not followed us to the hotel. But suddenly, I heard a loud and terrible scream. It came from our room. Then... Too late. 
I understood. The monster had promised to be with me on my wedding night, but he had not planned to kill me. The scream came again, and I ran to our room. Why did I not die there and then? On the bed, Elizabeth lay still, in the cold sleep of death. I took her in my arms and saw the marks of the murderer's fingers on her neck. Other people in the hotel had heard the screams and came into our room. I sent one of them to call the police. The others left me alone with my misery. I held Elizabeth close, and as I held her, I saw the monster watching me through the open window of the room. There was an evil laugh on his face. I pulled my gun from my coat and fired at him. I missed, and he ran from the window and jumped into the lake. The other people heard the noise of the shot and came back into the room. I showed them the place where the monster had jumped into the lake. We searched the edge of the lake, but we could not find him. I returned to our room and lay on the bed next to my dear wife. Suddenly, I had another terrible thought. At this very moment, perhaps my father was fighting the monster, with Ernest dead at his feet. I left the hotel and returned to Geneva as fast as I could. My father and Ernest were safe, but the awful news of Elizabeth's death killed my father. He had loved Elizabeth dearly. He became ill, and after a few days, he died in my arms. So the evil monster had brought unhappiness and death to a dear old man who had never hurt anybody. I do not know what happened next. I think I left the real world and entered a dangerous world of dreams and madness. Later I found that they had put me in prison because of my madness. After many months they let me free. I had only one wish, to find and kill the monster. Chapter 14 I decided to leave Geneva forever. I took all the money that I needed and left the town. Before I left, I went to visit the place where William, Elizabeth and my father lay at rest. I stood there and promised them that I would stay alive until I had killed the monster. A loud, evil laugh rang out through the silent night. Then I heard the monster's voice. It pleases me that you have decided to live, because that is just what I want. I ran towards the voice, but I could not catch the monster. I saw him running away, but he ran faster than any man could go, too fast for me to catch. But I followed him, and I have been following him since that day. I shall stay alive until I can catch him. He wants me to live as long as possible. He wants me to feel, day after day, the pain and misery that he has given me. He leaves messages to tell me where he is. He knows that I shall follow him. I am only happy when I am asleep. I dream that I am with my family and Elizabeth and Henry. 
when I am awake, I look forward to my death, to the day when I shall be with them. In his last message, the monster told me that he was going north. He wanted to take me where the cold would hurt me and make me more miserable. I followed him to the cold lands of the north and bought dogs and a sledge. Until now, he has always left me further and further behind when I chased him. But the dogs were very fast, and I was getting closer and closer to him. Soon, he was only one day's journey in front of me. He was going towards the sea, and I hoped to catch him before he reached it. The chase over the ice continued for about three weeks. The pain from the cold was very great, and I began to lose hope. I thought I would never catch him. My dogs could not run much further, and one of them died. Then I saw something on the ice in front of me. It was the monster and his sledge. Suddenly I was full of hope again, and I gave a great shout of happiness. I got closer and closer to him. Then a great storm started. The ice began to break, and the sea carried him away from me. My sledge was broken, and I lost my dogs. I was left on a piece of ice that was becoming smaller all the time. Many hours went by, and then I saw your ship. The rest you know. I ask you, Captain Walton, to chase the monster and kill him. Do not listen to what he says. He knows how to argue, and perhaps you will feel sorry for him. But remember that he is evil. Remember the deaths of William, Justine, Henry Clerval, Elizabeth, my father, and remember me, Victor Frankenstein. There is no more for me to say, except to thank you, Captain Walton, for your help and kindness. Thank you also for listening to my story. I want you to tell the world that the monster is a danger to everyone. I know that I have only a few hours left to live. But I can feel my loved ones near me. And I welcome death. Goodbye. This is the end of Victor Frankenstein's story. Chapter 15 Captain Walton's Note I, Captain Robert Walton, have added this final note to the story. When you have read it, you will know that Victor Frankenstein's story was true. Victor Frankenstein died a few hours after he had written his last word. I was sad to see him die because he had become a good friend. But he will not be unhappy or in pain any more, and I am happy for him. We laid his body in a cabin near my own. Later, I heard a voice coming from the cabin. I went into the cabin and saw a huge shape standing over the dead body. I knew that the horrible creature which was standing there was Frankenstein's monster. So, I have killed you too, the monster said to Frankenstein's body. Oh, Frankenstein, forgive me. How I wish you could answer me. I went towards him and said, it is too late for Frankenstein to forgive you. 
he is dead. His pain is ended. You do not know how much pain and unhappiness I have felt, said the monster. I knew that I was doing evil things, but I could not stop myself. Do you think I enjoyed killing people? My heart was made for love, like a man's heart. After I killed Henry Clavel, I hated myself. But I could not stop myself from more murder. Frankenstein would not give me a wife, but he hoped to find happiness with a wife of his own. He was not fair to me. But now it is ended. Frankenstein is the last person I shall kill. I have done all those evil things. But am I the only person who has done wrong? I wanted love and friendship. Think about Felix and his family, who hated me after I had given them love. Think about the man who shot me after I had saved his little girl from the river. But I know that I have done evil, and I hate myself more than you hate me. My own death is near. I shall leave this ship and go north across the ice. I shall build a great fire and lie down on it to die. I shall welcome the pain of the fire, because it will help me to forget the pain in my heart. I have felt more pain than Frankenstein, and when the fire has died down, I shall be at peace. The monster jumped from the cabin window as he said this. He got into the small boat in which he had reached the ship. The sea soon carried him away, and he was lost in the darkness.